address leaks all along this pipeline. And some of the work that we're doing is in network or partnership with the organizations listed here. So from youth coding work like Black Girls Code, Hidden Genius Project, Level Playing Field Institute, and Yes We Code, to career development, Code 2040, uh, National Society of Black Engineers, and UNCF to entrepreneurship support, Blacks in Technology, Black Founders, Movement 50, Build Up VC. We're also working with large companies like Google, Twitter, Dropbox, and Twilio on diversifying their workforces and having more deliberately inclusive recruitment practices. Next slide. So as Michael Evans would say, how is this going to help black people? Next slide. So expanding tech access will, and this is our hope, expanding this uh, pipeline building will increase access to good jobs in a booming economic sector that tech represents now. It will help to build opportunity for wealth through entrepreneurship. And most importantly, it's going to augment the creation of tech-driven solutions and products that address issues relevant to us and our communities like, next slide, and like what Frederick Hudson here has done with his company, Pigeonly, to greatly reduce the cost of phone calls and correspondence between incarcerated people and their families. So he actually had this idea because he was incarcerated himself. Once he came out of the, the prison system, he got together with a team of people and created disruptive software that is now Pigeonly in order to greatly reduce these costs. Click once more. Like Tiffany Ashley Bell, who is a computer science graduate from Howard University and a current Code for America fellow, who created an app just on her own time and doing to let donors directly pay the water bills of Detroit families who'd had their water shut off in this recent tragic episode. Next slide. Like the young men who participate in Startup Weekend Black Male Achievement here in Oakland back in February who created brilliant app ideas in response to the question, would an app have saved Trayvon Martin, which was the theme of the hackathon. The winning team devised an app called Help Circles that would allow kids to quickly reach a safe adult when they, the kids, felt in danger. Next. And just this past week, in response to the slaying of Michael Brown in Missouri, the, these four siblings, the Christian siblings in Stone Mountain, Georgia, created an app called 5 to rate police officers, kind of like a Yelp system for rating police officers, creating a, an additional route for greater police accountability. So these are the kinds of solutions that are driven by the often overlooked and undervalued brilliance in among our ranks and our families and our networks and communities to bring about better solutions for black people, the nation, and the world. Now we recognize that this isn't a panacea. The tech itself is not a panacea for solving problems, but it's a powerful uh, solution. It's a powerful tool that we as black folk need to be sure to use for our advantage and for the advantage of uh, communities beyond us. And that's the K4 Center's approach, in a nutshell, to building black power megabyte by megabyte. Thank you. Cedric, as always, that was absolutely brilliant, and I have a million questions for you. Um, what I'm going to do and ask everyone else is to please send your questions uh, directly to our online channel. Um, we will have a very engaged, uh, interactive conversation amongst the panelists, but also with our peers who are actually online. Uh, next, we have our good friend Darnell Moore. Darnell is the co-founder of You Belong. He's also the managing editor and partner of the Feminist Wire. Darnell, are you there? I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, first, thanks to Apti and to Alvin Stark for the invitation to be part of this call. And just to reiterate what you brought up before, Alvin, um, this is unfortunately an opportunistic time to be having this conversation. Um, particularly what's happening not only in Ferguson, but in so many other spaces across the country, um, and also largely connected to a lot of the global struggles that we're also experiencing at the moment. Um, I'm appreciative of Cedric's um, slides and his presentation, and he gave some sort of micro uh, ways to sort of think about the use of 
technology. I want to just offer some broad thoughts, particularly in the relationship between social media and social change. So slide, please. Um, first, I just want to think about social media as a tool of democracy, or rather the way that it democratizes our knowledge sharing and knowledge production. And I want to start by giving a nod to Bell Hooks, whose book, Teaching to Transgress, is this is the 20th year anniversary of that book. Um, her book explores education as a tool of democracy, as a transgressive tool, a tool that can bring about transformation. And it also reminds us that knowledge production, that is the way we come to think, um, the way we come to know, the way we help others to know, does not and should not only occur within certain institutions and certain spheres that privileges certain people. Social media can be a catalyst for broadening the field, for broadening the, the space through which we can come to know and come to teach others. Um, so I think about um, education as a practice of freedom, and that's, that's what Bell refers to. And knowledge sharing then is also a practice of freedom. Um, in a time where mainstream media is largely controlled by the same sets of interests, governed by the same political investments, occurring within the same context of racial supremacy and gender inequity, economic exploitation that hinder black and brown folk, the poor, women, LGBTQ folk, and others. Um, we need new media outlets. We need alternative sites to do knowledge work. Um, in other words, we can't expect media outlets largely controlled by the corporate class to feed us the types of news and knowledge that will foster transformation. Social media, then, is a transgressive tool. Um, next slide. Um, Social change logically follows consciousness raising. And by social change, um, I mean both the process of correcting social ills and the real-time tangible results once that work is done. Um, we won't change. Our communities won't change. Our policies won't change unless we have a clear diagnosis of what the needs are and what needs to be changed, what the problems are and how we can change them. And I also describe my own process of political awakening or consciousness raising as that which happens to, to one being awake and out of sleep by virtue of an alarm clock. So there have been many moments where I've been sort of pulled out of sleep, moments where the alarm was, was went off. And um, though al those alarms, which were often sounded by others engaging me, me being in community, me reading a text, um, often happened through social media. I've developed community through social media. I've come to learn and know new things through social media. And the process of consciousness raising is something that happens daily. Um, and it's often through new media technology and social media that those types of moments occur for me. Next slide, please. Um, I just spoke about this, but social media, therefore, is a medium for consciousness raising. I think it's important for us to turn to it um, as an education, as a tool of education, as a pedagogical tool. It can actually catalyze consciousness raising, not just for us as individuals, but it does its work um, through coalition, through solidarity, um, through community building. Um, one of the most important aspects of social media is that it is it does allow for us to engage others. It allows for us to engage others whose contexts are very much different than ours. It facilitates learning um, and facilitates cross-cultural, um, transnational, global, um, forms of, of solidarity and means of learning. It also helps us to connect the dots between our struggles and so many others. Um, and lastly, it's just a tool that is used to, it is an alarm. It can become that quote unquote alarm clock um, that allows others to sort of wake up. And we're seeing that right now in a moment where we've had to turn to social media to get the sort of on the ground, localized news, the truth. Um, in ways that the mainstream media refuses to provide us, social media has become the site for us to learn and for us to engage and for movement work to be done. Um, we'll hear, I'm certain about, you know, Rashad Robinson's work, the work that he does, you know, it's daily of uh, activating us in our communities and our local spaces, but connecting us across communities to the broader work of black liberation. So thank you. Perfect. Darnell, thank you for that. Um, especially, I, I love this piece that you're, you're bringing up, social media as an alarm clock, as a way to build consciousness and to spark um, innovation, but also movement. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Um, I also want to introduce another dear colleague, and I would say a civil rights and racial justice pioneer in her own right, uh, Malkia Cyril, who is the executive director for the Center for Media Justice. Uh, her work is incredibly important and cutting edge 
and actually elevates this conversation in spaces of structures and policies, but also mobilizing individuals um, with a very sharp, keen sense of communications building. Malkia, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. We're ready when you are. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear about uh, the, the ways that we are um, building and innovating and using the technology at our disposal for, for real change. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about a, an approach to thinking about um, the use of media and technology in, in the digital age in the 21st century in which we live. Um, I want to start by uh, with myself, if that's OK. Um, so if you're like me, which maybe you are, maybe you're not, but probably you've been glued to the news for the last several weeks, um, anxious for any word from Ferguson, um, hoping that the story will be about uh, the systemic abuse of black bodies in every city, uh, the context of uh, black life, uh, something that helps explain to a, 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 a public what racism looks like. Um, but if you're watching the mainstream news, you're probably not getting that story. Um, instead, what you're probably getting is what content analysis repeatedly reveals, which is that coverage of race in America remains episodic and without significant context or structural cause. Uh, when blacks and Latinos are the subject of the story, the story is five times more likely to be focused on crime and violence. When whites are, uh, whites are overrepresented as victims, while black victims are less likely to appear in coverage at all. The, um, what's important about that is that that's, that's true now uh, with the coverage of uh, deceased young man Michael Brown, as it was with the uh, murder of Trayvon Martin, uh, the murder of Phoenicia McBride, the murder of Oscar Grant, the uh, prison sentence of Melissa Alexander, and the prison sentence of Tanya McDowell, a homeless black woman in Connecticut, sentenced to five years um, for sending a five-year-old son to a better school in a district she didn't live in. Now, one of the most important things I think about this is that um, we end up with a public narrative that racism is an individual perception, a personal problem, or an interpersonal dynamic, and that narrative makes it very hard to uh, make policy changes or other kinds of changes for racial justice. But this narrative um, is a structural problem. Uh, it makes sense to me why we have invested uh, a lot of our energy and time and money into technology access and education, into innovation. Uh, it makes sense to me why hundreds uh, converged outside of CNN headquarters in Atlanta earlier this week to protest what many believe is racist coverage of the protests in, in Ferguson. It's why we build independent black media outlets, including websites. But as the slide indicates, um, everything that we see is a shadow cast by which that which we do not see, which means that um, few acknowledge or create strategic responses to the cause and effect relationship between the visible framing contest and the back end racial inequality in media structure and policy that produce the media bias we see. The media bias that we see comes from somewhere. It comes from a structure that we can change. Just as there are structural problems, there are structural solutions. Next slide, please. Um, one of those uh, structural solutions is policy change. Um, media policies shape uh, what, um, what journalists are being hired. Media policies shape uh, who gets to own the media and how uh, consolidated that media is and in, into whose hands. Uh, media policies shape uh, whether or not communities can own their own broadband networks. Right now, 24 communities across the United States are prevented by law from owning their own broadband networks. And many of those communities are uh, African American. Um, media policies determine how much uh, money low-income schools will have for technology access. Uh, media policies determine whether or not uh, the, the internet that is being used right now uh, to bypass the historic uh, discrimination of the mainstream media will remain open to black voices, to black innovation, and to black perspectives. 
Media policy, however, has not been considered a, uh, a central part of the movement for racial equity. Now that's strange to me because leaders in the civil rights movement in the 1960s really understood the role that media policy plays in transforming public narratives on race. In 1964, next slide please, uh, when the Office of Com uh, Communication of the United Church of Christ and two black Mississippians challenged the broadcast license of WLBC, which was an NBC affiliate in Jackson, Mississippi, that lawsuit became the catalyst that would bring social reform to American broadcasting. They challenged, they challenged the license uh, because of the station's refusal to cover segregation in the South. And as a result of that license challenge, um, the, the, that case had wide-scale repercussions that allowed community groups in other places to challenge their stations and to negotiate for improved services and for the employment of people of color. That case is the case that set the, that set the bar for public engagement in media reform. So it confuses me why now um, the, you know, uh, the role that media rules and regulations play in shaping the kind of our access to the infrastructure of narrative isn't part and parcel of our strategy. And in particular, um, it's even more confusing because we're in a tremendous battle for meaning that, that internet companies um, really understand. Um, from Comcast, who um, you know uh, has prevented jacked up healthcare costs in, Ma in Massachusetts, partnered with Alex to fight against paid sick days in Philadelphia, withheld back pay in New Jersey, um, to Verizon, um, to AT and T. These companies actively work to reduce the effectiveness of regulation, um, to uh, and they threaten to withhold build out and service if they are regulated. This is the environment we're in, in which media companies Hello? Hello. I'm sorry, I heard a lot of music. <laughs> Can I hear it again? Um, Hello. Malkia, please continue. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. I don't know where that music came from, but it was yeah, lovely. Please do not use the hold button on your phone. Just use the mute button, but do not go into hold if you're speaking or if you have your phone on you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the bottom line is that these companies, um, they're very clear that they're in a battle for meaning. They know that. And they have invested millions. In fact, the telecom industry is second to none in lobbying in D.C. They are also second to none in investing in uh, uh, civil rights infrastructure and um, civil rights organizations. They invest in schools. They invest in scholarship programs for black communities. And so uh, it is clear to them that they are in a battle for me. Um, the question is, is it clear to us? And um, let me see. Next slide, please. Uh, I would say that it is clear to the vast majority of African Americans in this country that they're being misrepresented. The question that isn't clear is how to change that dynamic. The Media Action Grassroots Network, which is a, a network that I work with at the Center for Media Justice, um, has taken an approach to that change that is rooted in community organizing, rooted in building an independent social justice voice that is, uh, that becomes a, that is a player uh, and has a seat at the media reform table. Um, that organization, uh, the Media Action Grassroots Network, part of the Center for Media Justice, has 175 organizational members across the country, um, and together those organizations are fighting for universal access within a fair economy, democratic media regulations, and then this independent uh, universe of news, art, popular culture, and technology that uh, the two folks right before me spoke about. Um, they are partnering and organizing, and together they've worked to uh, prevent the merger of AT&T and T-Mobile in 2011. Um, they won, helped win the first open internet protections in 2010, and most recently uh, they organized, uh, we organized together to um, 
to uh, lower the cost of calls from prison, uh, from, federal, from uh, long distance calls from prison. And why this is important and why these issues are connected is this. Um, when we talk about making sure that our communities can innovate, what we really mean is that they have the tools and technology, but also that the laws support it, that the policies support uh, technology innovation in black communities. When we say we want our communities to be able to connect and speak out from the protests in Ferguson, what we're also saying is we want to make sure that there's a media ecosystem that allows for that, that the internet remains an open platform that can allow for that. Unfortunately, and next slide please, uh, this vision is really threatened, right? Right now, more than 100, 000, uh, 100 million Americans are living without equal access to the internet, and that divide is split along racial and economic lines. We got 95% of upper income ha households using the internet, 37% of lower income households don't. Um, and the vast majority of those with limited or no internet access are black, Latino, native, rural, or households with annual incomes less than $50,000. Um, people of color and younger adults and lower income people are more likely to rely exclusively on cell phones for access. Um, and that's critical because what does that mean when um, uh, right now we have the Federal Communications Commission, the, the uh, agency that regulates the uh, media, um, considering rules about the internet that um, would not protect wireless users. Now, I just juxtapose that um, for yourself and, and, and see what, that, what, what you come up with. Um, uh, this is where our communities access the internet and the rules that are being proposed uh, to prevent discrimination online would not cover wireless devices nor protect wireless users. So that's, um, that's critical. Next slide, please. Um, but at the same time, even more, at the same time, we've spent a lot of our energy as a movement and as a people focused on increasing access, focused on lowering costs. Very critical, um, urgent, urgent concerns, but they're not the only issue, right? As content moves online and as we experience this rebirth of, of, of black uh, genius, really, in my opinion, black voice on, on the open internet, um, uh, the black internet is quickly becoming a major driver of civil rights activism in this century. Um, from uh, folks on, on Twitter, you know, what we call black Twitter, pushing back uh, in all of these uh, cases that I mentioned earlier and really making deep change through the use of hashtags. Um, to the emergence and, and ex explosion of black websites um, that are using, you know, using the internet to bypass cable TV. I said in an article recently, it's not black cable that brought, bringing you the story on Ferguson, it's really the black internet. Um, and yet the internet is, is under extraordinary attack. Um, and again, in this fight for meaning, uh, um, major telecommunications companies who, who understand very much what's at stake, this is a very lucrative uh, 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 platform, um, are, are opposing uh, what the uh, federal communications should do um, which is reclassify the internet as a, as a common carrier. Um, so next slide, please. Um, what's important here is that um, these rules that are being proposed uh, will entrench discrimination online. Um, studies have shown it repeatedly. Economists agree. Uh, and over a million people um, submitted comments to the Federal Communications Commission um, saying so, right? The rules that do not reclassify the internet will, in fact, entrench discrimination online. Um, and I think that this is a price that black communities cannot afford to pay. Next slide, please. Um, in large measure, and, and I'll, wrap, I'll wrap up uh, here, uh, in large measure, um, the, one of the big reasons that we can't afford to pay this is that even as we fight for the benefits of the internet, there are extraordinary harms that are being um, uh, act, that are being enacted right now. Um, while all this attention has been paid um, to Edward Snowden's re revelations of the National Security Administration collecting millions of American phone records, very little attention has been paid to the use of the ongoing use of digital technologies to monitor the poor, discriminate against in immigrants, 
track consumers of color and criminalize consumers of color. These threaten civil rights. These threaten civil rights. We have right now in, uh, in over 40 local fusion centers that have emerged. Those fusion centers basically use digital technologies to, um, to do predictive policing. They use advanced drone surveillance. They use facial recognition software, license plate tracking, um, and, uh, and they are growing. Um, and they are aided and abetted through uh, the uh, illegal use of cell phone search and seizure, as well as uh, biometric scanning and um, other uses of, of big data. So even as we are organizing together, next slide please, to really ensure that our communities can access the benefits of the internet widely, there are threats to that access, there are threats to representation, and there are harm that we have to consider as we, as we build the strategy for racial justice. Those, those benefits and those harms can only be addressed if we begin to take media policy in hand and be a real player in the fight for meaning in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Malkia. As always, just full of richness, and I feel like I just had a graduate course in media policy. And uh, I am so thankful that, I know we're all thankful that you're in the front line providing this uh, information and education. Um, as well, I'm inviting folks to really send us your questions online, as well as there will be a resource guide, because I think there's so much knowledge being shared here that we want to make sure that you're able to tap into Malkia's brilliance in our institution. There were so many different intersections from education to criminal justice to civic engagement, uh, which is why media policy is the glue. And reminding us that media policy is rooted in a racial justice civil rights structure. Being that we're in the space of doing more education, we are fortunate to have one of our leading public intellectuals, Brittany Cooper, uh, with us from Rutgers University. Uh, she's also a prolific writer and blogger, and many may also know her work from uh, Crunk Feminist as well as her many appearances on the Melissa Harris Perry Show. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our good friend and colleague and public intellectual and voice, Brittany Cooper. Brittany, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure just to talk a little bit today about the power of social media. If you'll bring up that first slide. Um, so first, I want to sort of give a little overview. Many folks have kind of gestured towards or, or mentioned or alluded to um, the power of Black Twitter. Now, Black Twitter is not any kind of formal um, space. Uh, it is a space that responds uh, in the most creative ways um, to, to happenings in black politics and in black culture. Um, but what has become really interesting is the power of black Twitter to drive a story. So if you'll remember last summer when the Food Network uh, host Paula Dean was uh, found to be uh, to have used racial slurs and to have uh, engaged in problematic employment practices um, in her restaurants in Georgia, at the time she had a show on called Paula's Best Ditches. So Black Twitter uh, created a hashtag uh, riffing on that where they would, uh, you know, come up with uh, racially charged dishes like nooses and neck bones, uh, for instance, uh, as, a, as a way to kind of point to the, the racism uh, inherent in what she was doing. Uh, and, and essentially what they did was they shamed Food Network to the point where Food Network ultimately fired Paula Dean. Uh, even though she's tried to, to have a comeback, she has not been able to. And, and, you know, I mean, she was one of the most dominant chefs of the early 2000s. Um, we've seen this in a range of hashtags as well for far more serious issues. So what we know is that Twitter was a critical player in, the, in bringing George Zimmerman um, to arrest and to trial because it is Twitter that began to circulate uh, a very small news item about the killing of Trayvon Martin and to begin to ask questions as day by day went by and week by week went by and no charges had been filed against Zimmerman. Uh, and it is the power of the circulation of images on social media that has been allowed uh, folks to engage in the hoodie protest by changing their images into hoodies. Um, 
so we're now seeing that as a, as a strategy that has emerged from Twitter uh, is this ability to bring visibility to stories that folks are not paying attention to. Uh, we saw with Time Titled, which was along the line of Paula's Best Dishes, uh, dragging time for uh, doing a recent media story about what does the slang term bay, which is just a shortened version of baby, uh, mean. Uh, and so folks had a blast with that. But now, in this moment, what we all have learned in the last uh, 14 days or so, not even fully 14 days, is that Twitter has become the most reliable place to go to for uh, media stories about what's been ha happening on the ground in Ferguson because of real-time reporting, because of the, inter the uh, sort of connection between apps like Vine um, and Twitter. Um, so that kind of power um, gives us both some challenges and some opportunities, and so I want to. Um, so I wanted to point to that as a way to say that this is the way that social media um, is driving lots of social movements uh, for good and for ill. Um, so I want to talk about that a bit, and I want to come back to it. But can you bring up the next slide for me? Um, so. Part of what is happening that we're not acknowledging is that in that kind of social media work, there's a there's black there's labor that people of color are doing uh, to teach and reframe narratives about social justice, to um, to keep critical attention on what's happening on the ground, um, and and so I can give a better sense of that through my own work with the Crumb Feminist Collective, uh, which is a hip-hop feminist blogging collective that I started with a group of friends and colleagues in 2010. Uh, and in the last four and a half years of our existence, we've done uh, a million uh, blog views annually. We manage a Facebook community of 32,000 folks. Uh, we manage a Twitter community of 20,000 people. Uh, we have a Tumblr community that's in the tens of thousands, uh, in the ten thousands, I should say. Um, but we do that, uh, we have done that at any given moment with a consistent team of about four to seven writers. Um, so we do have folks who do more of our activism and social programming on the ground, working with girls, uh, working with a local feminist bookstore in Atlanta to do activism around um, the prison industrial complex and so forth. Um, but if you can imagine what it means to keep a community of 32,000 folks engaged over the course of a four-year news cycle, four-year period where the news cycle is 24 hours, um, to do the kind of writing that, um, that gives a critical framework for thinking about issues that matter. Um, four to seven writers doing that for free is, is a whole lot of labor, a whole lot of thought work being done with very little compensation. So we do get uh, donations. We have a donations tab and a bank account, and we do get uh, occasional invitations for speaking engagements, but by and large, this labor is done for free. By and large, a lot of the labor that folks are doing on Twitter to shape social narratives and media narratives is being done for free. Um, and, and so you have a, a moment where pe young people of color are driving the language frame for how we think about social justice issues, but they're not necessarily being compensated for that. Uh, one of the things I learned is I've um, started to build more, doing more public intellectual work. Uh, when I would talk to producers at NPR, for instance, one of the things they would say to me is, um, oh, yeah, we have a list of bloggers that our producers keep and read uh, so that we get ideas for stories. So these folks are really generating the way that we're talking about things, um, but we, we have to talk about how that immaterial labor um, goes uncompensated and what that means um, in a moment where we're seeing um, the wealth gap of people of color increase. Um, and we're seeing economic privation continue to lead to a whole host of structural problems. Um, next slide, please. So um, for me, uh, what is important about social media uh, and, and its convergences with black power um, is that right now you see black folks in social media leveraging it to change the narrative. Um, and that's really important in a moment like Ferguson where um, if we had only gotten a story from the news, imagine what the story would have been. It would have been angry rioters attacking police and there, to the point where they must call out tanks. It would have been a young man robbing a store and therefore having to be shot dead in the street for resisting police. Like there would be a very different narrative about Ferguson if it were not for particularly Twitter, but also um, social media more generally and bloggers on bloggers as well. Um, so social media allows us to change the narrative in ways that are politically quite salient and important um, and that materially matter. 
So the, the ability to bring visibility to those tanks on the ground assaulting those people has meant that the president had to respond, even though many of us, you know, are, are sort of wanted a different kind of response. It is unprecedented for a president to send a, an attorney general uh, to the site of a police shooting. Um, so we have four levels of government intervention um, and changes in police strategy midstream because of the power of social media. Uh, we're also seeing a moment where we're using social media to organize. So, um, so on social media, this is when Trayvon Martin was killed and folks wanted to have a hoodie march. Uh, a group of teens got together in New York, put out a YouTube video and said, meet us in Union Square tomorrow uh, at 5. And that's how thousands of people showed up for a hoodie march. It was done in 24 hours and led to hoodie marches around the country. Um, we're seeing a similar thing now. We're in the process of organizing a ride to Ferguson next week, and we're circulating that information primarily to folks via social media, and we're getting in touch with folks who want to come from across the country via Twitter uh, and Facebook. Um, so we use it as an organizing tool. Um, and last, it's, a, it's a, a tool that allows us to put forward new voices. So. One of the things that's happening is that there's been a democratization of the people that we have to listen to. Uh, so if there has been a toppling of the, the sort of experts of old, expert journalists, expert academics. Uh, those folks get, take, get taken to task all the time. Um, and so new voices are always emerging, and they wield an incredible amount of power, um, sometimes in ways that frustrate folks. Um, and they're both energizing and also sometimes concerning because they come with not always a lot of organizing experience, but always with a lot of passion. Um, and so, if you bring the last slide. Next slide. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so, for me, that means that there's some opportunities here for folks who are funders and folks who are looking to, to think about ways to make these processes more effective. Um, one is, is figuring out how to fund convening spaces for folks who are social media power brokers and activists. Um, to share resources and strategies. So one of the things we've learned is about both the, the sort of amazing power of the digital and also the, the limitations of the digital, um, that it doesn't take the place of a face-to-face -face interaction, uh, that it doesn't take the place of actually getting to know people and building with them as human beings, um, that, that meeting in person changes the tone and set of possibilities for conversations. Um, but a lot of times the reasons that you see young people of color, particularly black folks, turning to social media is because the amount of power and influence you can have in social media doesn't require you to have a lot of money. If you have a smartphone, you can get on Twitter and start a hashtag and say the things you need to say and start what feels like a revolution. That's an incredible amount of power, uh, and we need to be figuring out how to get these folks into spaces where they have the benefit of sharing their expertise with us and, and having us and others share our expertise with them. Um, also, creating funding streams for folks who are creating um, sites, creating innovative um, community and digital engagement projects, uh, whether it's um, like the sort of more technical side, as Cedric talked about in terms of coding and building platforms, or creative uses of those platforms. Um, I, I think a lot about uncompensated labor, uh, and it matters because at the CFC, we do, um, what we're doing, spend a lot of our time doing is our day job, and then we do CFC on the side. Uh, and, and so that's not sustainable, and, and to the extent that this will be part of a kind of broader political structure, social structure for social change, we want, to, um, we really want to have the sustainability conversation. Uh, and finally, um, aiding groups and individuals that want to create infrastructures that link online and on the ground efforts. So like the young woman who created the app to link the on the ground activism around Detroit's um, water crisis. Uh, and, and folks needing a quick way to be of support. We need more innovations in these regards. Um, you know, so the same kinds of apps need to be created for helping us think about Ferguson or helping us to connect organizations in Ferguson together, um, to connect organizations with resources to activists who need resources. Um, so thinking about that in terms of what app building would allow um, are all opportunities for us to leverage the power of social media uh, in really tangible ways. So um, I hope that those suggestions will be helpful. Thank you. Brittany, as always, thank you. Um, you reminded us about the power and the influence of social media. Though it starts off virtually, actually creates very concrete results. 
And uh, your words and your work are so critically important right now just to actually spark our own imagination, but to also think about ways for our, us to engage and to be supportive. So thank you, Brittany Cooper. Also, I just want to remind folks, please send your questions. We will have an interactive Q&A with the panelists uh, shortly. Uh, and Bianca is actually collecting that information. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our last panelist, uh, a young man who is heading up Color of Change, uh, probably the most premier um, interactive civil rights organization in the country. Uh, Rashad Robinson, as many of you may know, uh, is a well-known spokesperson for civil rights, but also a very uh, incredible speaker and thoughtful provider around these issues. Uh, Rashad himself is actually <laughs> Ferguson, so I want to welcome him to our panel discussion. Rashad, are you there? I am. I'm here. Great. Um, well, thank you for that, Alvin. Thank you for the introduction to the other speakers. Also, Alvin, thank you for calling me down. It's always um, it's over there. A nice thing after a, after a, a late night flight and 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 a, a long week of work. Um, you know, um, let's go to the next slide. And I just I want I want to jump right in because um, I want also want to get the question. So, you know, the 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 old rules are changing in terms of sort of how people get at information, how people move on information, sort of what constitutes politics, what constitutes pop culture. And I'm going to spend some time really talking about sort of the new rules and sort of the pathway forward for both advocacy and activism. Um, you all as, as funders, as people who, who sort of support um, issues and work on the ground, I'm hoping what, what, I, what I can do here is to sort of spur thinking about sort of um, new ways of getting at old problems, um, new ways of reaching um, audiences that we haven't been able to reach, and, and, and recognizing sort of the changing ways that that um, you know exists in the world that gets people to move on um, on everyday issues. You know, I, I just put up a couple of magazines with that that sort of span popular culture, politics issues. Um, these magazines just don't exist on paper; they exist on the internet. You know, we have a sort of a fusion of sort of how people are getting information, an abundance of information every single day. We're hit with all sorts of information from the newspaper to the television to the radio to the social media. And people are oftentimes looking for something to do, how to make sense of the world, how to make sense of that information. And, and, and the role of, of sort of next generation civil rights organizations like Color of Change is really to help people um, make sense of that and give people something to do in, in that space, not sort of a, a sort of top down something to do, but sort of a pathway forward, something with a clear theory of change that is we engage sort of multiple people who are having that same organizing moment at the same time, having that same aha or reaction of anger, happiness. Um, we can sort of build um, power around the individual moment and build longer term power by getting, by on ramping people into long term engagement. Next slide. You know, sometimes when people talk about civil rights and, and technology, um, and sometimes when people talk to me at Color of Change, they come up to me and they say, you know, we love what you all are doing. It, it's so new. You know, we don't, you know, and they talk about technology as if it's something new to black people. Um, and, you know, in the, in the, um, in the early 60s, um, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, SNCC, installed a watch line in their Shaw University office. Watch was the precursor to the 1-800 number. It um, was the line that allowed you to call law distance. It also allowed you to bypass the mob bell operators at the time, which were largely controlled by the White Citizens Council. And so they were able to sort of bypass mob bell, move information to Shaw University, move information to their offices, get information out into the field through the through the watch line, um, and, um, and, and, in, and in many ways, um, this technology didn't change their theory of change. It didn't change the fact that they had to have a good organizing strategy. So um, it didn't change the fact that they had to have good messaging and a, and a clear campaign plan. But the technology allowed them to move information quicker. It allowed them to sort of overlay on top of their strategy um, tools that allowed them to do their work better. 
in some ways the watch line sort of bypassing sort of the filters of the day was sort of a modern day Twitter. And so in, in many ways, over and over and over again, we've seen people and organizations and, and, and movements innovate with the latest technology. And, and so, you know, being known for the changes that we achieve as a movement rather than the changes that we resist is, is, is going to be key. Moving along. So um, we, I have this beautiful bird up here. Um, and um, I want to use this bird to just talk about um, a model. Um, you know, in the, in the philosophic world, in the advocacy world, there's a lot of conversation around models. We need a model for this. So why don't we call this the model for the civil rights movement, right? It, it developed over time. Um, this bird, right, is an example of that. It developed over time. It, it, um, it adapted to its environment. Its it look and its it sort of inside infrastructure represents the, the sort of needs of, of the environment in order to survive, in order to grow. In order, to, in order to be able to be successful inside of its ecosystem, it, it, it adapted and became you know, this, this bird that, while successful in its ecosystem, may not necessarily be a model for any other environment or ecosystem anywhere else. And so to the extent that um, our ongoing need to be creative, to be um, innovative, to look for new ways of doing things must sort of animate us as we deal with battles that are that are um, where we are oftentimes going up with against forces and and figures much larger and more money than we are. Um, thinking outside of the box of what constitutes a model and thinking more strategically about sort of what type of um, what you know what type of tools what type of features are necessary in order to survive within the environment that we are, are inside of. Next slide. I want to leave this up here for a second. Um, I want to leave this up here because I want to go into the, the idea of moment to movement. Um, and um, every time I put this slide up, people turn their head. So if you turn your head, I can't see you turning your head. Normally, if we were in the room together, I would tell you to turn back and, and look at it for a second. Um, and, not, and I don't want to ruin your day. Um, but what I do want to do is, um, is that I started off by saying that every single day we hit with all sorts of information, from the television to the radio to the newspaper. And that information inspires us, activates us. It gives us sort of a path forward. But there are, there are, there are moments that exist. Um, you know, every so often that sort of animate us at a different level. There are figures and images and, and, um, and opportunities that are those that allow us to leverage for longer term power building. Um, and, and we can do that. We understand some really key things about how the world has changed, how people get information, and how people sort of react to individual moments. So can we go to the next, the next slide? So this is a color of change petition um, on, um, on building a movement around um, justice for Trayvon Martin. It was, a, it was directed at the federal government. It got hundreds of thousands of signatures from people all around the country. Um, that was the low bar act. In, in the sort of internet world, it's a low bar act. The, the beauty of, of what we do on the who email um, at color change is that we own those emails. Um, very different from the huge, the huge number of people that follow us on Twitter or Facebook. We don't own that. Those are corporate platforms that are owned by someone else and that we've already seen in the last year Facebook change its algorithm. So what we once were getting 40 to 45 percent of our new members through Facebook shared, they've changed their algorithms to make more money and sort of the organic sort of viral nature of stuff on Facebook has changed unless you spend money. Um, but I want to talk about this petition in terms of the changing nature of activism. So people signed this petition and they joined this movement. Now they probably didn't really necessarily join Color of Change. 
because people are not joiners the way they used to. Folks will not be card-carrying members of the ACLU or card-carrying members of the NAACP. Joining organizations looks very different today than it did 15, 20 years ago. People, because of our sort of um, access to information and access to um, 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 sort of multiple opportunities to engage, people will move inside and outside of platforms and issues that matter to them. They will take action on some things and not action on others. And organizations that don't sort of adapt, that remains sort of that bird with a big beak that doesn't change to maybe a changing climate or a changing, um, you know, water climate or what have you, those will not sort of survive in the new, the new age because of so the changing way that people sort of are engaging. And so because people are not joiners the same way, our value proposition to them has to be much deeper than being part of a brand or caring about an executive director, or caring about sort of the inner workings of an organization. Our value proposition has to be about impact. It has to be about winning campaigns. It has to be about driving narratives that people feel like they can get involved with. And so in the midst of this Trayvon Martin moment, we had another campaign that we were operating at the same time, specifically around voting rights, and specifically around the American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as ALEC. We were working to get corporations to divest from Alec. Alec had pushed the voting rights laws all around the country, voter ID. They'd also put Arizona immigration laws. 98% of Alec's funding came from corporations. We worked really hard to get these corporations to leave. In the midst of this, of this campaign, we found out that the Stand Your Ground law was also pushed by Alec. We were able to pivot these members, people who we call members, the people who had signed the petition. And we were able to move them to another campaign on something else within a matter of 24 hours. We were able to then scale them up to phone calls. And we were then able to scale them up to writing letters to the editor, showing up to shareholders meetings, taking, giving money to run radio ads. All of these sort of things were sort of part of the, the sort of ability that we had within technology to be able to drive sort of people's organic engagement on issues and move them inside and outside of campaigns that matter to them. So the old way of doing things was that we would have maybe started a whole new campaign or that we would have spent, you know, another several months sort of surveying people to see if they cared about the issue. We were able to, through the internet, quickly tell if the issue had resonance, be able to test multiple messages with people, be able to get real-time feedback. And while people were not joiners, they were able to have a really deep impact and a systemic impact on sort of ending Alex's run on voting rights and gun policy. In the organization with 70 left corporate sponsors, a $1.4 million budget shortfall, having to close its DC offices and move to um, a smaller office in Virginia, and losing hundreds of its legislative members um, in the aftermath of a civil and racial justice moment, which oftentimes doesn't happen um, very often. Next slide. The way that we're communicating looks different. And, and we used to be in this age of communication and engagement where there were these top-down issues that were issued and, 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 and the leaders would figure out how to make things happen. But we are now in the age of participation. And I think, you know, Brittany really laid it out really well when she talked about social media. And, and that does help to animate um, sort of what, um, you know, what's happening in the, the social media age. This sign right here, this slide, um, does this look like communication? This was a um, um, a book burning party that happened um, that happened in um, in in, um, in uh, wow, it's not Missouri. Um, that's where I guess was, but um, it was uh, Minnesota. So it happened in Minnesota in a small town where basically there was a local ordinance. The Tea Party had taken over the town. They were gonna they were running campaigns to defund the library. Now, they could have, now the, the folks that wanted to fund the library could have done all sorts of things to try to protect the library. They could have been in the old communications mode of handing out flyers, signing petitions, trying to run ads. But instead, they built a campaign called, we're going to have a book burning party on August 5th. And they started flyering the town in this idea of, of having a book burning party. Um, people were outraged by the idea that folks would burn books. Um, and that they would, and people turned out to protest this book burning party, when in fact, 
the book party party was a participation mode. Mm -hmm. It was the idea that essentially we are burning books if um, if we defund mm -hmm. the library. The library was phased as sort of part of that effort, and um, and sort of new ways of thinking about sort of um, communication as participation. But how do we actually engage people? Thinking of the people in our network as communicators themselves because of social media, because of the power of third-party validation. And that goes to the next slide. The idea of who an uh, expert is has changed. So once, once upon a time we were in this age where like a legal case came down and they only brought on talking heads that were lawyers for um, an issue around health and they brought on the doctors. The idea of who's an expert, who, who has access and power to talk about an issue is increasingly changing. It's really important for civil rights organizations in particular to remain vigilant around this because, because more and more voices can sometimes gain access to, um, to, to platforms and blur the lines between sort of fact and expert and, and, um, you know, and truth. Uh, but at the same time, if we're smart about it, it creates more opportunities to put out sort of a type of empathetic real voices that change hearts and minds and just don't sort of spur sort of thinking. And so, you know, hitting people in their hearts and minds and allowing that to sort of translate into how people make decisions is also helpful. And so how sort of expertise is changing is also important. I have just a couple more slides and then I'm wrapping this up. Um, the idea of who a hero is and how do we leverage sort of um, Different images, different public figures. Um, I use the I use the Pope here as an example of of a of a figure inside of social media that to some could be a hero or a, a villain. I could have just as easily used a picture of Beyonce. Um, the idea of 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 public figures who sort of animate feelings and drive conversation give us the opportunity to create new dialogue and discussions and bring people into political debate on the other people who may not have necessarily cared about our issue before. You know, we're running economic justice conversations um, and using the Real Housewives of Atlanta and uh, the way that reality programming, um, you know, sort of animates this idea that black people make bad decisions and can't be trusted and, 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 and then inform tax policy, policy discussions. So trying to hold the VH1 and Bravo accountable around reality programming and its, and its portrayal of black women in particular um, is, is sort of like a, a way of, of thinking about who's a hero, who's a villain, how do we talk about public figures, and how do we utilize um, their presence to drive conversations and drive narratives. It, 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 it is it's incredibly important sort of in the age of of people being hit with all sorts of information, that we find the right ways to on-ramp people. It's not going to necessarily be the, the position paper or the data or the data point that is going to give people sort of the the, the moment, the aha moment that's going to spur their activism. Um, the idea of who a leader is is changing, and and you know, young people, you know, becoming, you know, more and more sort of um, um, the sort of public figures, and Brittany talked a little bit about, you know, this when she talked about Twitter, um, and the power of to disrupt who the voices are that we have to listen to, to disrupt who the sort of powerful um, validators are um, of, of, um, of truth, of, of kind of trends, and being able to be focused on that, engaged in that is incredibly important. Um, I, I put up this slide about Reddit. Um, does this look like an influencer? We use a lot of color of change, um, but Reddit is, I think, going to be a really, it's going to be continuing to be a growing space. Um, the idea of crowdsourcing and, um, and seeing what bubbles up and being able to see what bubbles up in a variety of different communities is, um, is I think, going to definitely be a new trend over the next several years. Reddit is a, is a platform that um, allows for um, folks to be able to, you know, put up content and then for folks to be able to vote on it and, and, um, and move it up and down based on sort of how people, how people have responded to the information. Um, being able to see what is trending um, before it trends. 
being able to see what could possibly trend before it trends, um, and being able to be part uh, um, ahead of the curve will be increasingly key for our organizations that are fighting very big battles. Um, you know, I use a, an image from Will and Grace here. Um, I, you know, was the senior director of programs at GLAD before I came to the color of change. The idea of culture and cultural images impacting the way people think and feel, and the work that I did, particularly in Hollywood, and have now moved over to color of change. Um, the way the, the the fusion between Hollywood and our digital platforms, um, and the sort of increased importance that we are that we are we hold Hollywood accountable. Um, now, Kia talked a lot about net neutrality, which is key for us at Color of Change as well. But sort of both sort of on the the um, execution side of what comes into our home, but also on the policy side of media. You know how we hold media accountable. Um, is key to being able to leverage in the power of media, to put out powerful arguments that are sort of bigger and maybe more broader than anything we could sort of write in a policy position paper or a research paper, changing hearts and minds, reaching new audiences. None of this is perfect, but at the end of the day, they oftentimes lead to much deeper um, um, organic conversations and reach audiences that we may never be able to reach through our email list or even through our Twitter or social media. Um, change is not happening in Sunday morning talk shows. But they're oftentimes reflecting what is already happening and what's already occurring. The ratings for these shows is going down, down, down with every year. And change is increasingly happening on social platforms. And so this is not where change happens, even though we all spend a lot of time trying to get market share here. Increasingly, these places will become less and less important, and the people on them will become less and less important. And we can end there. We can end there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rashad. Um, Thank you. Before we open it up to the larger audience, I just wanted to give a quick summary of all the talent that actually shared information. Uh, Cedric started us off with really understanding the importance of creating a pipeline for innovation uh, to really explore where black communities need to be in the 21st century workplace. Uh, I think also really underscoring the need to understand that there is black genius actually happening. It's just a question of really connecting it to the social opportunity. Darnell was so, in, so smart in really reminding us about social media is a democratizer, right? It is really the conscious raising. It is where our collective alarm systems really become engaged. Malkia was brilliant in really representing the notion that the intersection of media policy and racial justice are one and the same, that these activities are actually happening in D.C. as well as in our homes, reminding us the importance of where broadband is, is actually occurring and actually how it influences both students who has access, understanding that broadband access is equally as connected to the racial color lines as anything else. Brittany brought into our imagination this whole notion of social media uh, as it creates a movement to advocacy, literacy, and collective engagement. So what starts off in the virtual space really is concrete and really has important impact. Uh, Rashad ended their conversation with understanding how the new civil rights organizations are really using um, media to create justice impact, to use his phrase from movement, I'm sorry, from moment to movement. Uh, so I know that we have several questions on the queue. So I would like to turn the microphone over to Bianca Alston, who's actually collected uh, questions from our online community. Uh, Bianca, are you there? I am here, Alvin. Thank you very much for turning it over to me. And thank you all for participating, as well as thank you and the panelists for everything that they've shared. Um, we have had we have some really great questions posed, and I'll jump right into it to take advantage of this time. Um, and even ask the uh, panelists and um, those listeners that we have to maybe stay on as long as they can, um, because I think these are some really thought-provoking questions. So I'll get right into it. The first question I want to pose to all the panelists is, how do we move past seven-second advocacy? We get a posted status or a posted question on Facebook and Twitter. People retweet it and reshare it on Facebook, but nothing else happens. How do you think we can yield 
tangible change from what is being shared? Um, I'll begin um, by just saying, one, I think we have to recognize that, um, so, so I'm, getting, I'm becoming really pragmatic with questions like this, right, meaning um, that the social movements have never been a majority of the populace. They've always been the, the movement of a committed few that are very vocal in particular moments. So I think that part of what social media actually does is it engages more people than the committed few that are usually doing on the ground um, activism. Um, I do hear the concern about needing to create more pipelines for um, for things to change. I think that part of the challenge is that we're bombarded every day, all day, um, with causes that we should be concerned about, um, especially in this moment where we're seeing so much brutality. Uh, and I think the larger question is how do we cultivate folks that, that can can do um, issues advocacy as opposed to expecting um, people being invested in one issue uh, to, to then become an activist for that issue. But one of the things that we've done in some of the activism that we've been doing around um, uh, advocating for a more gender inclusive framework in the President's My Brother's Keeper program uh, is we send, when we send updates to the group of folks who signed the initial petition or open letter that we put out, we say, if you have five minutes, do this, send this tweet, uh, share this post. If you have an hour, do this, call somebody, share this information. If you have more time, do these things. So I think also just acknowledging that um, circulation of information is a part of what we do. Raising consciousness is a necessary part of activism. And then giving people um, more options uh, than just that one if they have more time. This is Malkia. I can uh, uh, jump in on that if that's OK. Um, I think that my short answer uh, to build off what was just said, which was brilliant, is uh, that one, as the technology, as technology companies have um, grown and blossomed uh, and really taken over quite a bit, uh, many of the platforms that we use, um, that same level of investment has not been seen in black organizations um, on the ground. Uh, in black communities building institutions that can actually organize people um, resulting from kind of online activism. So we have to increase the, the uh, strength of our black institutions within black communities to be able to move from seven second activism to sustained activism over time. Um, the other thing I think is important here is that um, there are other spheres of cultural influence which we need to be considering. Um, schools and the fight for public quality public education, uh, so long as our schools are as privatized as our media infrastructure, um, we're, we're not going to see the, the same level or the kind of um, civic engagement uh, and literacy that is required to engage beyond that seven seconds. So we need to be investing in quality public education at the same time as we're investing in <clears throat> other kinds of uh, civic uh, engagement infrastructure in our communities. So the, the platforms are not the solution. They're a tool. They're a path. But um, quality schools and, and, and resourced uh, organizations are, in fact, I think, a, a, an extraordinarily necessary complement to online activism. And, and I, I want to pick. I want to pick up on what Matt just said because I think it's 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 right on. Um, and and just underscore that if, if you have a bad strategy or no theory of change, um, um, then you, setting up a Facebook page or a Twitter account, you will have a bad strategy on Facebook or a bad strategy on Twitter. They, these these are platforms and tools that you know, kind of advancing on the the, the SNCC story. They, they allow us to do our work in new ways, quicker ways, allow us to, allow us to um, you know, um, innovate on, on, on sort of the core elements of, of, of our work, but it doesn't, but it doesn't necessarily change um, um, sort of what we should be thinking about as sort of core pieces to our work. And that is about good organizing and building, bringing people up a ladder of engagement. 
and, and, and taking sort of folks who care about the issue and turning them into activists, turning them into influencers, turning them into leaders um, um, through a ladder of engagement and building, building movement that way. And so, um, you know, corporate platforms like Facebook and Twitter will not allow us to do that alone. They will give us opportunities if we find the right ways to use them to be able to build in some ways. But, but in and of themselves, they are simply, they are simply tools. Thank you very much for your input, Malkia, um, Brittany, and Rash Rashad. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question in the interest of time. Um, is it possible for any of the panelists to address the bridging, um, the bridging of the gap happening between Af different African American generations, particularly between the baby boomers and the millennials having um, both input on social media? and how these different perspectives are merging through media? And are any organizations leveraging this to maximize change? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if, if no one else is. You know, the, the average age of a color of change um, member is like 43, 44. Um, so, um, and because it's email, um, you know, and email is a, is a tool um, more and more of folks who are sort of have jobs and is increasingly used tool of, of baby boomer um, gener generation. Um, you know, we, um, you know, we, we, we see it a lot in the issue because, you know, if you go out to, 100,000 people on an app, you can quickly start seeing things come back and seeing the different ways that people respond to an issue. Um, and so in terms of sort of how we've had to learn how to message on issues to different audiences, we went out on a campaign um, around a young man um, that was escorted off of a, a U.S. airline, a U.S. Airways uh, flight in San Francisco because his pants were sagging. He was put in in um, chains, and we went out to talk about the criminalization of young black men, um, and and um, and you know, in the outreach, we knew that we would get some pushback around sagging pants from some from from different areas of our of our membership, and we tried to inoculate ourselves against that. We said, you know, we're not defending sagging pants, but I got sort of long email lectures and a number of phone calls, and and you know, what have you. From, from, from many of our members talking about how they used to dress up when they travel and talking about sort of the, you know, elevating huge sort of generational divides in both the response and the engagement, while at the same time a number of hip-hop sites, um, you know, leveraged our petition, shared it, pushed it out, um, and, and sort of the, the different response um, in terms of that. We see different responses on um, issues related to gender justice on our list from members and, and LGBT rights and, and immigration reform. And, um, and how we thought about messaging and creating common ground, you know, it's been a fact the, the, the social media and the internet has given us a lot of um, tools to be able to do that because we can test messages on 20,000 people and then tweak it or test messages on 10,000 people and see what type of responses we're going to get back, see what type of um, Feedback, and so I do think the technology, in many ways, has given us the ability to be able to both um, continue to keep and drive and hold um, a rather large membership. Thank you for that, Rashad. Do any of the? Um, I guess I'll just. I'm going to, sorry about that, I'm going to move on to another question here. Um, are there any revenue generating models or ones being leveraged that are benefiting from the black contributions of social media? There was um, a lot of commentary about black Twitter or black activism. Um, on Facebook and Twitter, and how often African Americans are not getting 
credit for the ideas that they're generating. So do any of the panelists know of any models out there that are working to correct this? This is this is Cedric speaking. I, I don't know of a model offhand, but I, I don't want to say that it doesn't exist. Uh, just because of the sheer number of startups that are finding their ground, finding their way, and uh, if uh, a revenue generating model has to has the opportunity to exist, I bet that it does. I bet someone somewhere is doing a friends and family round to generate the the money to develop a, a minimally viable product and it is seeking seed stage funding for it. So I, I don't want to say that it doesn't because if again, the, if it's possible to generate revenue from social media, from a social media platform, somebody is on it. Somebody's thinking about it and trying to get uh, get the the product, or service, or platform together. I will venture to say. I will dare say. Uh, thank you for that, Cedric. Um, there are a few questions about how black social media can encourage positive movements, such as the one that we're seeing now with the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, and discourage negative movements, like the prior challenges that we were seeing. How do you think we can leverage which movements get are more popular among, especially the youth uh, of color. I think uh, that, that. Yeah, I think that that actually is the is the is, is I think the the big question I think for foundations and for um, sort of more legacy-based organizations? And the answer is, and this is the tough answer, is that you can't. That is, that yeah. is what has made social media, and that is what makes, that's the part of the power of the Internet, is that we actually yeah. can't control it. And when organizations think that they're controlling it or try to control it, they, they, fail, they fail miserably. Um, That's right. You know, um, people are making choices um, about their engagement. So now, let's recognize that we can't we can't control it. So then, how do we leverage it? And that I think that I think is a more that's the question where we can get into like what we can actually do because there are all sorts of moments, right? That that can be leveraged, that can be on ramp into things that we we want to we want to happen in the world that we want people to engage on, that we want people to think about, that we want people to be active on. And to find those things and try to drive energy to them, recognizing that for every every time I think, you know, look, here we go. Anytime a staffer or my staff comes to me and says they want to create a viral video, um, you know, that they're that they, like they're 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 in a re education moment. Because you can't create a viral video. <laughs> a viral video. Maybe you can create a viral video if you have millions of dollars at your disposal, and you can buy and you can basically um, buy bias bias virality. But but then that's not actually technically a viral video. Um, there's nothing mm -hmm. organic about that. And so, to the extent that that what oftentimes goes viral is a reflection of the culture and what's happening in our larger world, and being able to understand that tap into it and be able to drive um, um, our agenda in that and, and being good um, being being sort of good wind box for for the world and being able to direct that wind in in a in a way that that, that allows our sailboats to get to the, the place that we need to go, I think is is what we need to be thinking about when we're working in this space. Absolutely. I, I just want to underscore what Rashad, Rashad has already said about virality. It, it's the, the concept is called virality because you don't know what's going to pick up and, and 
grow uh, and multiply in its popularity. So as Rashad said, to, to say, oh, I want to create a viral video is a Sisyphean task. It's, it's not something that you can, at the onset, say, de determine the success of. Um, I also guess I want to make a distinction between the things like the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, which is a campaign which has a structure around it and a strategy behind it, and there was there was great thought evidently put into how they were going to do this. And the fire challenges were, which were some kid deciding, I mean, if, if I'm interpreting fire challenges as the same thing, some kid deciding he was going to set himself on fire and record it, and then other folks started picking up on it. That, the latter is an example of virality. The former, to me, is not. That's a, that's a campaign. Thank you, Rashad and Cedric, and especially Cedric, for that distinction, because I do think that that is very important. So for the interest of time, um, as we are now over, I'm just going to ask one last question um, to our panelists. And this is, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, how this will be interpreted to the conversation, but the question is, how do we maintain the integrity of black institutions and their agendas when we have um, major funders like the UNCF accepting donations from organizations that have not necessarily been major um, supporters of black progressive communities, such as the $25 million contribution from the Koch brothers um, that, made, that was made to the UNCF last year. Do we have any insight about how we will be able to further push for civil rights, or is this undermining this process? That's a great question to be presented or, or to be discussed by, we, we have the expert on this on this call, Rashad Robinson, colorofchange.org. For the sake of full dis uh, for the sake of full transparency, I'm the board. I'm on the board of Color of Change, and one of our uh, one of the principles, one of our values, is that we don't accept corporate money, and therefore can't be swayed by a corporate agenda. So I, I want to now defer to Rashad. And yeah, and I also want to um, uplift. Um, Malkia as well um, in, in the work that she's done. And, and recently Malkia said something to me at a conference in Philly that it's not just about the money. I hope I'm, I hope I'm paraphrasing or, or quoting you as close to it, it, it right now, Mac, but I, you said it's not just about the money, but it's about the influence. And, um, and, um, and, and I, and I want to I wanna piggyback on that and say that the money that the UNCF at this point has taken from the Koch brothers, wow, you know, as someone who's been fighting Alex since I got the color of change and fighting other things that the Cokes have put into the world since, you know, I started my career, um, seeing anyone align themselves with the Koch brothers that, you know, is supposed to be on our side, seeing anyone that stands up on a platform with the Koch brothers, you know, is, is upsetting. I just don't know if the Koch brothers' money is going to necessarily change UNCF's mission. And so we have to wait for that. But, but that's a, that is, you know, who knows how that's going to shake out? What is different, though, is on the question of net neutrality and, and internet freedom, which you know Matt uh, raised earlier, Matt here raised earlier, and and I want to I want to I want to um, you know talk about the fact that many of the civil rights organizations that are that are fought, that are supporting publicly supporting basically two lanes to the internet, a fast lane and a slow lane, and doing it by echoing. Um, Echoing the talking points from AT&T, Comcast, um, and the other big telecom companies, they're echoing this idea of trickle-down economics. Basically, that these telecom companies won't move um, won't move uh, broadband into low-income communities unless they can make more money on top of the massive profits they've already made. Um, the civil rights organizations won't debate us on this. They won't, you know, they won't explain further. They've signed on to these platforms. There's a lot of money at stake. And that does undermine um, sort of both credibility, partnerships, and relationships. But at the end of the day, uh, not having a free and open internet underscores everything that we have talked about on this call. From the advancement and the 
the um, elevation of bloggers to platforms like Twitter and Facebook being able to innovate and, 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 and come to life and become a big corporation. The next age of, of, um, of companies coming out of Silicon Valley, which will hopefully be led by more black folks and people of color and women than the last generation of organizations, will have a much higher bar for entry if we lose a free and open internet. And the pay-to-play the pay -play system of our internet will look much more like our cable bills and like our cable system than the internet we experience today. And so, um, you know, the, the protection of a free and open internet, of being unapologetic in our pushback um, as civil rights and, 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 and social justice organizations, when we see organizations taking positions like this, um, is, is part of the work. Um, but we've just spent, you know, a good amount of time talking about the power of, of digital organizing, of talking about the power of the web, and of talking about the power that these tools have to level a playing field and to give more voice and power in our democracy and our economy. And we are on the verge of potentially losing that and going in a much different way. And it, it is one of the structural democracy and economy fights of this generation is to protect the internet and to protect it as a right and a tool uh, for all of us. And I'll just add really quickly to that a, a, a excellent summary um, that, and this is Malkia, um, that that we can think about um, the influence of corporate telecom money on our right to communicate um, in the same way that we think about the influence of corporate money in our political system. Um, they're not different. They're the same. In fact, spending millions to uh, lobby um, various political parties and elected officials to take a particular position on a on a uh, on a on a public policy issue is not that different from investing millions into organizations that you specifically think have an influential voice in an arena of policy that you want to take. Um, that money is not going into uh, local grassroots communities. It is not going into um, uh, significantly expanding education in, in poor communities. It is not going into um, the, the kinds of uh, goals that we have as a, as a community. Um, and it's not limited to the telecommunications industry. The fast food industry is also dumping millions of dollars into um, our uh, legacy civil rights organizations. And the arguments that have been made are that um, in, in, their defense, in the defense of this process, right, is that um, to critique it, to say, in fact, I am concerned about how this level of investment, the degree of investment, um, is, uh, is, is influencing uh, the, 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 uh, our ability to, to raise a civil rights concern about, um, about uh, policies like um, the fast lane, uh, policies that will create a fast lane of stolen on the internet, but other policies as well, that, that even critiquing that or raising that as a, as a problem is met with um, three arguments. One, you're, you're saying that we're stupid, that we can't think for ourselves, that we just parrot the, um, the uh, policy goals of corporations. And it, it's important for, I think, a uh, uh, philanthropic community to really understand that there is a big difference between saying, I think the millions of dollars you are receiving and the fact that Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon are sitting on your board of directors may have an influence, an impact on your political decisions. That is very different than saying uh, you're an idiot, <laughs> right? And then um, two, that uh, that in fact um, too much. This is a European regulating the internet is a European approach, and it's too much. Um, it's not. It's not in the best interest of, of communities of color. But it's fascinating because we do not take that approach as a community on any other issue. We, we in fact, um, take a very strong, uh, we want very strong government regulations that support civil rights. So to, to oppose those regulations in this space is, is, is of great concern to me. And then finally, um, the, the idea that 
this new wave of leadership, of digital leadership, online leadership within black and brown communities is not real. It's not a real civil rights movement. And in fact, that simply ignores all of the dynamics that have been shared with you all on this call, and, and it's simply not based in fact or, or, or the current social context. So I want to take this moment to um, thank all of the panelists for such a rich and thought-provoking and engaging conversation. Uh, more importantly, this is more than just a conversation. It's really meant to encourage everyone online to really move into action. It's really meant to spark ideas and transformation inside our own institutions. Uh, each panelist was very eloquent in providing um, deeper engagements on these particular issues, and I think they're all available for more conversation and also for more funding, of course. What I want to do is actually give everyone a final 20-second um, closing remark, if we may, before we close it out with Abby. So I'm going to start with uh, Brittany. If you can think about just a 20-second summary that you would like to leave the audience with, and then we'll just go through the line. So Brittany, will you start us off? I think Brittany is gone. Okay. Uh, I think there are two folks who are gone. OK, I know Darnell is gone. What about you, Cedric, since you stepped in? Uh, 20 seconds. So I, I'm glad that we're having this conversation about uh, digital power, the digital age. I think that keeping tech, what it means as a, a sector and tools, is critically important uh, for black communities moving forward, because without it, we get left out. Rashad? Yes. Um, having just got home this morning from um, Ferguson, Missouri, and having been there and left some of my staff, staff on the ground who are you know, working to um, move, um, move images through um, both our email list and through um, live streaming, um, the moment to movement um, organizing, the potential of digital organizing is clear. And we take these moments of peril and crisis and fight for justice, but we can bring on ramp people into a larger movement and work to fight for the systemic change around bias, police reform, criminal justice reform, education, and all the other things we care about. Digital tech has the real potential for, to help us build our movement long term. Thank you. Last but not least, Malkia. Oh, it looks like she also had to okay. step off of the call. I, I just want to say thank you again on behalf of the panelists and for those who are still on. Uh, it was an engaging and thought-provoking conversation. I would like to turn it over now to Edward and the staff of APSI. Yeah, thank you, and thanks to everyone that's on. Um, this was a dynamic and, again, a very timely conversation. Um, as APSI's um, focus is on philanthropic partnerships in black communities and the need for us to make sure that we all are connected and, and leveraging all the powers that we have, we understand the, and we've got a greater understanding of the power of social media in this equation. So. We hope that this conversation doesn't just end here, but that you all walk away with some new thoughts and resources on how to really leverage what you have um, before you, even if it's just your telephone, your, your, your mobile phone, as a device to help um, mobilize, help engage folks. And so if you continue to share thoughts um, to us at AFSI on our Twitter page, our Twitter handle, or through our Facebook page, um, check out our website, um, www.abfe.org. And please continue to stay in touch and help us figure out how to best um, deliver the right information to you. You will all get a, a survey soon. And when you get that survey, as well as some resources that we've also compiled for you, please fill out the survey, give us your feedback so that we can help, uh, again, create great programming for you. So thanks to everyone that's participated. Have a great day. Um, stay safe wherever you are and continue to keep doing great work. <laughs>